Children shot to pieces, he said, and I can't stand it. Thomas Tibbles, reporter. For three days, the frozen bodies of the dead, including Bigfoot, lay where they fell at Wounded Knee. Finally, the army dug a large trench at the massacre site. Then, as they collected the bodies, a blanket was seen moving. Beneath it, snuggled against her dead mother, was a baby girl. The official military history is called Wounded Knee, the last battle in the Indian Wars. But the tenacious struggle for Indian survival, as symbolized by a child clinging to life for three days on a frozen field, continues to this day. 500 nations will follow a path that covers thousands of years and will bring us full circle to 1890. In this hour, we will travel back in time to three stunning civilizations that flourished long before the arrival of Europeans. To the Anasazi of the Southwest, the mound builders of the Mississippi, and the great pyramid builders of the Maya. But when we return, we'll go back even farther to creation as seen through the eyes of Indian people. When Earth was still young and giants still roamed the Earth, a great sickness came upon them. All of them died, except for a small boy. One day while he was playing, a snake bit him. The boy cried and cried. The blood came out, and finally he died. With his tears, our lakes became. With his blood, the red clay became. With his body, our mountains became. And that was how Earth became. Taos Pueblo. Pleasant it looked, this newly created world. Along the entire length and breadth of the Earth, our grandmother extended the green reflection of her covering, and the escaping odors were pleasant to inhale. Winnebago. God created the Indian country, and that was the time this river started to run. Then God created fish in this river and put deer in the mountains. Then the Creator gave Indians life. We walked, and as soon as we saw the game and fish, we knew they were made for us. My strength, my blood is from the fish from the roots and berries and game. I did not come here. I was put here by the Creator. Menainik, Yakima. In the Old Testament, Adam and Eve were forced from the Garden of Creation and expelled to a cruel world. For most North American Indian nations, it was, and is, very different. They stayed in the garden, the place of their creation, the single place on Earth most perfect for them. The Crow country is a good country. The Creator has put it exactly in the right place. While you are in it, you fare well. Whenever you go out of it, whichever way you travel, you fare worse. The Crow country is exactly in the right place. Alapuish, Crow. There is a song in everything. Madeix, 
Kim Shen. Make my eyes ever behold the red and purple sunsets. Make me wise so that I may know the things you have taught my people, the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. Make me ever ready to come to you with clean hands and straight eye, so that when life fades as the fading sunset, my spirit may come to you without shame. Tom White Cloud, Ojibwe. To the outsider, the sun-beaten deserts of the American Southwest are a harsh and unforgiving land, reluctant to support life. To the ancient people who lived there, it was a place where the Creator provided everything. There is nothing there that you can see, even to this day. Very little vegetation, you see a lot of rocks, you see a lot of sand. The Hopis have always maintained that that's a chosen place for them. It was chosen for them by the Creator, the Great Spirit for the Hopis. The ancient people of the desert were the ancestors of all the modern Pueblo nations. To their Hopi descendants, they are known as the Hisatsunam. But to most of the world, they are known by the Navajo name, Anasazi. Around 900 AD, the Anasazi flourished in a wide circle covering parts of modern-day Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. The Anasazi found balance with their world. They learned where to find water, and how to harness it. Villages joined together to build dams, reservoirs, and irrigation canals, turning deserts into gardens of corn and squash. They were a people intimately connected to their land. In a very real sense, they emerged from it. Generations before the time of Christ, the Anasazi lived in subterranean pit houses, sunken homes with stonework walls and broad, strong roofs, formidable protection against the searing sun and bitter cold of the desert. With time, they adapted their above-ground storage houses into living spaces. But the underground pit houses were not abandoned. They were retained as spiritual places of teaching, the place of origin the Kiva. One hundred years before the first Gothic cathedrals were built in Europe, the master architects and stonemasons of the Anasazi were building great Kivas that could hold 500 people. Around 900 AD, the Anasazi leadership embarked upon a bold and visionary plan. Create a Mecca for pilgrimages and a focal point for trade at the very center of their land. They chose the barren, treeless Chaco Canyon, 100 miles northwest of present-day Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was a monumental undertaking. They built 400 miles of distinctive graded roads and broad avenues, all leading to the canyon. At distant points, signal stations were constructed where fires blazed to communicate across the vastness of the desert and to guide travelers at night. Over 50,000 trees were cut down in the surrounding mountains to build the towns of Chaco Canyon. Along with traders and pilgrims, the roads carried resources to maintain dozens of communities. None compared with the largest single complex the Anasazi ever built.
Pueblo Bonito, the wonder of the canyon. At its peak, Pueblo Bonito's 800 rooms may have housed over a thousand residents. Some sections overlooking the main plaza loomed five stories above the canyon floor. The plaza pulsated with life. Women gathered the colored corn blanketing the rooftops and knelt in rows to grind it. Children played. Men returning from the fields gathered to talk. Thirty-seven sacred kivas scattered throughout the complex speak to Pueblo Bonito's rich ceremonial life. During ceremonies, the feet of dancers pounded the ground smooth as spectators huddled against buildings and thronged the roofs to watch. But Chaco Canyon was more than a spiritual mecca. It was also a center of trade and commerce. And trade in one stone, more valuable to Chaco's Mexican trading partners than gold or jade, was the engine of the canyon's economic growth. Turquoise. Here, raw stone arrived from distant mines for the craftsmen of Pueblo Bonito to cut and shape into small tiles and beads, which were then traded south to merchant centers in the heart of Mexico. There, they were transformed into extraordinary creations. For 150 years, trade fueled the Chaco economy, but the wealth and power of the canyon was fleeting. Chaco's major turquoise consumer, Tolan, in central Mexico, fell to civil strife. Extended drought or hostilities also may have contributed to the downfall of Chaco Canyon. By 1150, it was in decline. The great turquoise road over the Mexican High Sierra abandoned. But the Anasazi world still flourished. The people of Chaco Canyon simply moved to other locations. Many went north to Mesa Verde, which at that time was reaching its cultural and architectural height. There, under the shelter of the pine-studded mesas of southern Colorado, the architects of Chaco Canyon would help create some of the most stunning buildings of all time. The largest of these is known as Cliff Palace, though it is a palace in name only. These beautiful stone buildings of the Anasazi were home to common families. It was a society based on equality. Men rotated service on public works. Women plastered houses. The man who farmed also carved. Spiritual leaders tilled the fields. Each time when I see and visit any ancient dwelling, I feel close because these are my ancestors, my forefathers for centuries. With little meditation, looking at their dwellings, within a few minutes, half hour, I get refreshed. The people of Mesa Verde and many other Anasazi towns relocated around 1300. The period of the ancestors came to an end and the modern day Pueblo world took shape. Traditions that live today in the American Southwest, the way of life, the architecture, the religion, are the resonance of a heritage reaching back thousands of years. <laughs> 